Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Monday, August 7th, we are studying Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. In today's text, Solomon speaks of the times that God appoints in our lives so that we would learn to find our joy in the Lord and rest in the true fear of God. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Dustin Beck. Pastor Beck serves at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. Pastor Beck, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Good morning, Pastor Apple. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? Oh, man, if I were any better, they'd have to throw me a parade. There is a time for that. There is, apparently. Maybe a there will be. time for parades and a time for... To refrain from parading. That's right. That's yes, right. indeed. So, Pastor Beck, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, is perhaps one of the most famous chapters, maybe within Christendom, but also in popular culture, for a variety of reasons, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but let's talk a little bit more about the book itself. What should we know about Ecclesiastes, what Solomon's been saying so far as we look at this chapter today? Yeah, isn't there a song about this section? I think so. I think so. To everything, turn, 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 there turn, is a turn, season. Turn. Yeah, I don't, we're not going to talk about that. Um, Ecclesiastes is an interesting book. Uh, I mean, you know, Pastor Apple, when you picked Ecclesiastes, I was really excited about it because it's it's not it's not really asking the small potato questions. It's asking the big questions in life. I mean, what is the meaning of life? Is kind of what's being discussed throughout the book, um, and it's the answer is kind of interesting, uh, especially <laughs> you know if you if you don't have the extra sort of the rest of the story, I guess you could say, um, because as you read through this, um, it starts off with this this word that I'm sure every guest has brought up. This is sort of what Ecclesiastes is known for, uh, is this Hebrew word hevel, okay? It's translated in some Bibles vanity or meaninglessness um, or, I mean, I, li- I like the, the way that, the, um, that one of our lexicons puts it is vapor, Okay, so I mean, have you seen before just that that fog that is out there on the morning, you know, a cool morning? I, I wish that we would get a cool morning soon. Uh, that fog that is just so thick, it looks like you're walking through a cloud and it looks like you can reach out and grab it. Yep. But then you pull your hand back and your hand is empty. Okay, now I'm not saying that's the meaning of life. Uh, that's not the answer that Solomon gives here. By the way, I didn't mention uh, Ecclesiastes written by Solomon, the son of David. Um, the book Ecclesiastes uh, is it's thought to have been written in Solomon's later life, okay? So Solomon contributes uh, three books, and I believe some psalms as well. Uh, He writes um, the Song of Solomon, which is very reminiscent of sort of a a young lover, you know, uh, uh, pursuing his wife, uh, you know, and everything like that, uh, which is a picture of God's love for us. Um, He writes Proverbs. Solomon is well known. uh, It's discussed uh, discussed in the Book of the Kings uh, for Solomon and his his many Proverbs, his great wisdom that everybody read and was just blown away by how how smart this guy was. Um, And then we have Ecclesiastes um, that starts off right, I mean, right at the beginning, the words of the preacher um, that's what Ecclesiastes means, after all. Uh, the Hebrew word is kaholoth, which has to do with assembling folks together for listening. And then it comes into the Greek, ekklesia, um, which is the word for church or gathering together. Um, and there you get Ecclesiastes, right? The, the preacher, the, the guy who's speaking to the gathered together folks. So it's as if Solomon in his later years is gathering together all of the people so that they can listen. Uh, but what Solomon has to say is a little bit... Uh, it might put a damper on on the rest of us, because Solomon is this grizzled old king who has found out the hard way um, that even though he's got all the wisdom in the world, you know, the wisest man that ever lived, he hasn't always lived by that wisdom. Mm-hmm. He, has, uh, he has neglected the Lord's way. He has chased off after women and power and prestige and wealth, all of those things that he didn't ask for when he was a young king, and God granted him whatever he wished for, and he asked for wisdom. 
and, and God gave him these other things, and these other things, actually, he, he chased after those instead of abiding in wisdom, which is to fear and love God. And so uh, as this grizzled old king, he gathers everyone together, and he says, vapor, vapor, says the preacher. Everything is vapor. It's just, it's this thing that you can't hang on to. It's this thing that you can't take control of. Uh, and, and this is, like I said, it's, it's an interesting way to begin a book about what is the meaning of life, Right. And what we find throughout the course of the book is that life is meaningless apart from uh, the fear and faith that we have towards God. A life yeah. lived without God is is meaningless. It is, you know, vapid. It is, it's here today, gone tomorrow. So, I mean, that's a that's a big topic for a book. Um, I commend you for uh, for studying it here. Um, I'll just say one more thing, and then I apologize. I haven't let you let you cut in. Um, we've got thirty seven times where uh, the word Hevel is used in the book. Um, to describe this meaninglessness, this vapor that we can't grab onto. Um, we've got also uh, uh, one of the uh, defining features of Ecclesiastes. You've got 29 different times where Solomon describes uh, our lives as lives lived under the sun. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get into the text today. Uh, but the way that he finally ends the book in the 12th chapter is he says, he's basically come to accept that life is fleeting, that life is it doesn't have meaning in and of itself, but instead he ex- learns to accept and to pray, thy will be done. And he writes in 12, verse 13, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Okay? So he has this, this perspective that says, um, life is meaningless apart from God, but with God, life actually has meaning. Uh, and the stuff that is slipping away from us that uh, as time ticks, Right, even those things, um, God is, is is in His heavens, and God is is ruling and reigning over time on our behalf as well. Mm. Yeah, we get a little bit of a flavor for the hope that is there at the end of the book sure. in the text that we've got today. Oh, definitely. There, yeah. It's one of those places where Solomon does change directions rather abruptly. It seems that happens a couple times in the book, so we get some of that hope today. But what I want to ask you a little bit more about is what you were saying about the the likely times in life when Solomon wrote the books that are attributed to him, yeah. and, and particularly reflecting on the fact that it seems Solomon writes this later in life. The first guest I had in this series was Pastor Jacob Dandy, and he oh, suggested sure. that the, the book of Ecclesiastes is what every 20-year-old needs to listen but won't listen to. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and so, knowing, and I do this, I think, every time, knowing that you teach high schoolers the scriptures— yeah. I'm curious if the book of Ecclesiastes comes up when you talk about the Old Testament with them, and if so, uh, how you approach it with them and how they receive it. Sure. Now, um, high schoolers are, are are notoriously difficult to read um, because you usually have blank stares looking back at you, uh, but I'll, I'll attempt to answer the question. Um, yeah, when you talk to high schoolers about this, um, this is in the uh, wisdom literature unit. So we're walking through, we've talked about Psalms, we've talked about, we've gone through some selected Proverbs and some things like that. Um, and then when you get to Ecclesiastes, yeah, the important thing that I've kind of found is that you really have to lean into the second part, because the, the first part of the statement of Ecclesiastes is that life is meaningless. But we can't leave the kids with that, you know, and you got you got to make sure and and really de-emphasize life is meaningless, um, and you gotta, you got to really strongly emphasize and lean into and, and really preach at them uh, the second part, which is life is meaningless without God, yeah. okay? Because this is what Solomon found in his life, is that you can chase after um, all of the, the best, you know, the riches, the power, the prestige um, as a king. You know, he, he, the land expanded, you know, their borders— um, treaties with all of these other nations. Um, of course, Solomon, you know, he chased the women. He, he had everything that you could ever want. Uh, and it's at the end of that, he still says, none of this compares to a life lived in the fear and faith towards God, because I've got all of this stuff and somebody else is going to take it whenever I die. I'm, I'm going to be forgotten right? Um, I watched a, a, a video that was kind of recounting the book of Ecclesiastes, and it, it kind of made the point. It was like, you know, maybe you have that mountaintop experience. Um, my, my son, uh, oldest son, you know, Dylan, uh, we, uh, a couple of months ago at the beginning of summer, we actually got to climb to the tallest mountain in Texas. M- Texas does have mountains, dear listeners. Um, we climbed Guadalupe Peak, and uh, we went to the top of it, and, uh, you know, the I think the um, Solomon would sort of respond like this. He'd be like, oh, wow, that's really great. You climbed a mountain, you know? That's been there for 
you know, thousands and thousands of years before you ever stepped on its face. And you're just a blip in time when you're dead and gone that mountain's still going to be standing there, you know, so it's, it's almost Ecclesiastes invites us to take an inventory of, mm. of how we matter in this, in the, in the grand scheme of things. And the good news for the Christian is that we can say, Jesus says that I matter, right? I'm a baptized child of God. I've been washed into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so I've been set aside. He, he has written my name in the book of uh, life before the foundations of the world. That's Ephesians 1. Um, so there is great hope for us, even though time is fleeting, even though we experience that right now. Uh, we have faith while we are here under the sun, that the one who is up above the sun, uh, and, and also uh, you could say our life lived under the sun, S-O-N. I saw a couple of books that made that kind of uh, yeah. that kind of distinction as well, that our life lived under the one who is above the Son, that is God the Father, and lived in the Son, S-O-N, that that life, it does matter, it does have significance. So everything else is is slipping out of our grasp and out of our control, but God is actually in control of all things, and He loves yeah. us. So that's yeah. that's kind of how we talk about that with the high schoolers. Yeah, and I think with with high schoolers, young younger people, to emphasize that life has meaning with God yeah. in the faith and the fear of Him is important when you're younger, so that when you do get older and you're looking back on your own life, you don't only look over it and see only meaninglessness, but you do right. see those moments where the Lord was at work in you through your in your life that does give it real meaning, again, found only in Him. Pastor Dandy does make a great point, though. I mean, the, this is what every 20-year-old should listen to but won't. Um, the unfortunate thing about perspective is you usually don't have it until after it would have been, you know, yeah. beneficial to you. Uh, we've all lived 100% of our lives up until this very moment. Um, and those of us who have had, you know, I tell them, you know, the high schoolers all the time, listen, I mean, I'm 20 years older than you guys are. I've lived a lot more life, but I'm not going to take away from the the 100% of your 16 years that you've lived up until this point. Um, I can just say, hey, listen, you know, I'm seeing in, you know, in the, what was the old, uh, you remember the old computers when you used to adjust, you know, it would be like 256 colors or 16 right. colors. You're still looking at it in 16 colors, high schooler. I'm looking in 256 or do they How still have that option? This? I don't, do they still have I that option? Know. I don't think so. I think it's a lot more colors. I don't 16 know. 16 colors, man. Yeah. All kinds nice. of, are those colors or pixels or what you talking about? Why are we talking about computers? I, I'm color? not sure. I'm not sure. Focus, perspective. That's what we're talking Time. about. Time. Time, which is the theme for our text today. Any overarching yeah. comments about this section of Ecclesiastes before we read it? Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Our, our text today, uh, it is a, a sort of a brief poetic discourse. I mean, once we start reading the text, uh, all the listeners will be like, oh yeah, I've heard that before. I mean, it's this, you know, you're going through this uh, this poetic structure in Ecclesiastes. It's this wisdom literature of of the 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 vapor, the mist, the vanity of of wisdom, of wealth, of self indulgence, of all these kinds of things. Uh, but then you get this little section where we're we're not going to be talking about vanity, and instead we're just going to we're going to talk about the seasons, the times. We're going to talk about the stuff that goes on in them. Uh, and then the last half of our uh, text today uh, is sort of the explanation of that little poem. So that wraps it all up for us and kind of makes things come into clear focus of, okay, so what do we do with this? There's there's time for this. There's time for that. What does that mean? Well, you got to think about things from God's perspective, too. Well, let's take a look at the text. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. 
also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. That's our text for today. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Pastor Beck, as you said, the poem itself is probably pretty well known. Maybe the first introductory verse, too. But sometimes we do forget what comes before, what comes after the the famous sections of Scripture. So talk right. to us about the introduction there in verse 1. Yeah, the introduction. Um, so, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Uh, the two different words in Hebrew that are used uh, to describe the season and the time, um, I mean, these are these are intentionally different words. Um, a season there is the Hebrew word zeman. Uh, it refers to an appointed time, okay? Um, and then eighth is the, uh, the time for every matter under heaven, the second word that is used. And that's um, as I understood it, that's actually more of just time the way that we experience, like what time is it, or, you know, um, we, we will do this for a time, uh, the way that we would just kind of talk. Um, so when we say that there's a season, that means there's an, a, an appropriate and appointed by God time for things, but then there's the time for things underneath, uh, or things down under, under the sun where we experience them. Um, this, is, this is similar to, uh, I know that this has been talked about on your show many times, uh, the fact that uh, in Greek you have the words uh, chronos, where you have like a chronograph, chronography, the study of time, right? And then you have kairos, which is a lot more like, you know, an appointed hour when my hour has come, when this time has come. Um, and so there is kind of that distinction. Uh, interestingly enough, the Septuagint actually flops these two so that you have uh, oh. in all things a chronos um, and kairos, an appointed time uh, in every matter or purpose under the heavens. Okay, so um, I didn't I didn't de- dive too deep in that. I did look at the Septuagint, um, but I was I think just trying to find it. You were just pulling it up, yeah. Lo- I was trying to find it, yeah. <laughs> I pulled it up just to check while you were reading the text. So you were reading, and I had an unfair advantage of thirty <laughs> seconds of, of of listening and finding it on my on my software here. Nevertheless, okay. So what we need to understand is that there are different ways to reckon time, right? Mm. Um, time is different uh, as we experience it and as God experiences it, because God sets the times. God, uh, as I mentioned, you know, in the introduction, God, uh, before the foundations of the world, which don't don't spend too much time, <laughs> pun, thinking about before the foundations, because how can there be something before the foundations of the world, before time existed, before, you know, that's the best way of putting it, but how can there be a before time? Because time has always been the way that we measure things, but apparently there is eternity. There is a, a, a before time. And so the hope for Christians is that before the foundation of the world, God wrote our names uh, in the book of life. Um, but when we see for everything there is a season, I think that that's looking at it uh, from God's perspective, right? Uh, and then a time for every matter under heaven, that's talking about the way that we experience time. So as we're here under heaven, yeah, there are times, uh, you know, just to get into the poem just a little bit, here's the part that everybody starts knowing, um, a time to be born and a time to die. Okay? Uh, we all know this. Everybody, you know, most of us celebrate birthdays. Okay? Um, if you've lost a loved one, um, you know, you will remember that day for the rest of your life. Okay? Um, and so as we reckon time, that's, that's what we experience, is that we do mark the days, and we know deep down that there is a time for us to, die, to, bo- to be born and a time for us to die, okay? And then, uh, as, as I mentioned before we came on the air, um, it just sort of, this poetic, you know, sort of um, poetic um, discourse here, uh, it sort of just unpacks all of these various different uh, events or activities uh, that sometimes we experience in life, um, and all of these are, in, in a way, they contrast with each other. So being born and dying, there's a time to plant seeds, and then a few months later, there's a time to pluck up what is planted. I know that you uh, recently just studied uh, a bunch of psalms on sharper iron, and one of the things that I appreciated was uh, when you would talk about Hebrew poetry, you talk about the fact that there are usually uh, two lines in a Hebrew, you know, in a section, a, a couplet of Hebrew poetry, and that the first line will introduce a statement, and then the second line will either contrast it 
where the second line will restate it in another way, adding maybe a different detail, or maybe it will like intensify it. Okay, it, can, it might add explanation to it. And I really think that's what's going on, for instance, in verse 2, which says, there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. Now, in, in most of our minds, we kind of think of that as like, okay, well, I, I was born at the ripe old age of zero days old, um, and then fast forward. I, I don't know about you, Pastor Apple, I'm planning to live to be about 102 Right. I, I'm thinking Psalm 90. Moses says yeah, 70, 80. Yeah, 70, 80 by way of strength. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So you fast forward 80 years. Most of us, you know, I, you yourself and, and you and me, we're both uh, in our late 30s, you know. And so we're kind of like, hey, we're not even at the halfway point. I'm just, you know, I'm still riding the wave kind of a deal. Um, but the second half of verse two, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. I think that describes a time to be born and a time to die. Right. Which is to say, I mean, if you plant something, I know you're a gardener. I know you've got uh, your prized tomatoes and, and, and other things that come out of your garden. Um, so we plant these things. And what, a couple of months later? Pluck them up. You pluck them up. It's time to, to pluck up that which is planted because time's up. And when you really think of it, I mean, that's I don't again, we don't want Ecclesiastes to be too dark of a book, but that's the way that life is. We think that uh, birth and death are like a lifetime apart, and they are, but in the grand scheme of things, a life is more comparable with seeds that are sown, and then they're harvested just a short time later. We're a blip on the radar. Hope everybody's feeling really uh, uplifted today by Sharper Iron. <laughs> well, so here's, here's where I think this does start to uplift, though, is the yeah. fact that you have these two perspectives on time together, so that the the chronos, to use the Greek, sure. you know, that just the passage of time, Solomon says God has his kairos, his appointed time. And I think that's where, again, and we could we could spend all kinds of time discussing each of the pairs individually, yeah. but just thinking about the poem as a whole, what's surprising, but I think also comforting, is that the things that are the, the more negative side of things, so the time to die, the mm. time to pluck up, the time to kill, the time to weep, the time to refrain from embracing, all of those are still a part of these appointed times yeah. that, that God is appointing. Right. And I think that's what's surprising, maybe at first, but also then ends up being, at least starting to move toward the comfort that Solomon's going to have for us in this book and in this chapter as a whole. I completely agree. Um, and again, looking back at the, the Septuagint and the way that they render this, um, this is kairos. This is an appointed time. God has appointed for us a time uh, to be born and to die, to plant and to pluck up what is planted. All of these things are appointed by God. You know, He knows the day that we uh, will breathe our first breath. Okay, He's not surprised when, oh, that baby came a couple of days early. No, God already knew that. That's that's in that's in God's in God's plan, right? Uh, and then when we are taken from this veil of tears, when we are uh, called home uh, to uh, to be at the Lord's side, um, He knew about that too. Okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah, let's, um, uh, can, we, can we jump through a couple of these? There's a couple that are maybe not as surprising. Uh, they just kind of seem like that's a regular part of life, and there are a couple of, that are, a couple of them that are a little different. Could we maybe sure. jump through a couple yeah. of these together? Take the lead. Okay, all right, so. It's a time let, to dance, so you lead. It's, a, it's time to dance, I love it. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's just jump to the very next verse. Um, verse 3 kind of stands out. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. Well, um, I'll, I'll tell you this, Pastor Apple, I, I think we had, we had mentioned this before we came on the air that uh, we've had folks who have, you know, asked if this could be, if this would be a good uh, scripture lesson for a loved one's funeral, hmm. you know, and I usually, you know, okay, well, let's, you know, what about that one, a time to be born and a time to die? Okay. You know, and I'll, I'll open my sure. Bible and I'll start reading it for them. And we get to that very next section, a time to kill and a time to heal. And they kind of make this face and go, let's go on to Isaiah 25 or Job 19. <laughs> Right, they do that to you too. I'm sure. Right, a time to kill and a time to heal. Um, this is this should not be read as us, you know, a time to murder. Okay, um, remember who's speaking here. This is King Solomon. So when he says a time to kill, he's not saying you know you should go out and kill your buddy or something or go kill your enemy. Right. But he he's saying that this is um, this is war and peace. There's a time uh, to go out. There is a time as the people of God, uh, especially in Solomon's day, when God would tell his people. Uh, go out and wage war against the, you know, the Philistines or the um, 
the Amorites or whoever it happened to be that day, right? There is a time uh, to kill, and there is a time to heal. Um, and so we can we can understand that. We, uh, you know, even in our day, we experience, um, is this a time for peace, or is this a time uh, when when warfare is maybe not, I don't know if I want to use the word required, but when it's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a big you know a big leap from just there's a time to be born and a time to die. Now we're talking about not just being born and you know being given life and life slipping away, but now taking life or preserving life. Hmm. So I think yeah. that that Solomon, when he writes this, uh, obviously you know under the influence of the Holy Spirit here, these these are God's words. But when he writes this, uh, I almost wonder if there is something to the fact that it just it kind of turns up to eleven right off the bat. You know, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Hey, there's a time to kill and a time to heal. Really? Okay, so we're talking about not just life and death in terms of somebody uh, is born at a very early age and dies a long time later, but we're talking about taking life, ending life, stopping life, or binding up uh, the uh, the broken and uh, and caring for them. That's a lot going on in, in just a couple of short verses there, Pastor Apple. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a lot going on in, in all of these verses. We're going to keep digging through them. We're going to do that more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Dustin Beck this morning about Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Lutheran Church Extension Fund exists to support Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and church workers. How do we do this? Your investment with LCEF makes it possible for LCMS churches, schools, organizations, and church workers to receive low-cost loans for new and growing ministries. And faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, make that possible when you invest with LCEF. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, August 7th. We're studying Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 15 with Pastor Dustin Beck. He serves at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. Pastor Beck, prior to the break, we'd started to look at the various pairs that Solomon gives us in this poem about a time to do various things. Let's jump down to, to verse 4, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Yeah. Yeah, so we we took thirty minutes and we made it through three verses. We, we've got to we got to pick up the pace here. Uh, I'll, I'll see what we can do. So when we see a time to weep and a time to laugh, um, I think that we've all experienced uh, this this distinction. We've all experienced you know those times when when crying is appropriate, right? Um, when a loved one passes away, when when there's great tragedy, or or even when you know um, a couple of years ago when the when the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, uh, took place and all of that, uh, there were t- there were times when we would just kind of break down and just weep for the sake of, you know, our loved ones who were in nursing homes and we weren't able to go visit them and everything like that. Uh, but there are also times, there are times when it is appropriate for us to gather together to laugh. There are times when there is great joy. So we experience these times and, uh, you know, there, there are some times when even we can experience these uh, and it can almost turn on a dime when you're, you're just in that deep, dark place, you know, of... Um, you know, grieving together as family, um, and then someone will tell a story about about the deceased, and all of a sudden there's just laughter in the midst of that. Okay, so I think that, you know, where we, back in verse 3, when we were talking about killing and healing, breaking down, building up, where we had that kind of turn up the intensity, maybe here we even, we bring it back down to something that is universal to the, the, the experience of mankind. We bring it back to a place where, yeah, I've, I've, I've shed some tears, and yeah, I've, I've laughed a lot. You know, um, there's there's bittersweet moments that we experience in various seasons of life. Um, and the same thing with with mourning, with dancing, um, different circumstances have different um, results and there are different uh, results that are appropriate to the situation. OK, um, and, and so I think that uh, Solomon almost is maybe you could put it this way, that he's giving us permission to weep 
when it's time to weep, and he's giving us permission to laugh when it's time to laugh. Because sometimes we get we get so caught up in like, oh, well, this is how I'm supposed to react to this. This is how this is supposed to be. Um, yeah, there's there are emotions that accompany uh, the various um, the various events that take place in the course of a, a person's life. So, absolutely, yeah. right. absolutely. Well, I think that's that's where a text like this can be very appropriate for a funeral, sure, because that is the time to weep and the time to mourn, right? And in the the Christian funeral, then to know that that time to weep and time to mourn actually is under the Lord's direction. It, it's his appointed time, and that he is also the one who turns our mourning into dancing. That yeah. can bring us comfort at the death of a loved one, knowing that this is under God's appointed time. He has cared for our loved one in Christ by calling that loved one to himself and promising to raise that loved one from the dead on the last day. Right. That's where a text like this can provide comfort at a Christian funeral. Yeah, because we grieve not like the rest of the world who has no hope, right. but we grieve knowing that Christ is risen and his resurrection is a pledge and, and a token of our own resurrection on the last day. So you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, this is pointing us to the fact that we do have hope in Jesus, um, and it's not an empty, vacuous hope, but it's a hope that is filled uh, with the same Jesus who emptied the tomb on, on Easter. It's, it's filled with, with him, and as surely as he is risen and living to this day, um, will we also, um, uh, uh, hope will give way to sight when Jesus comes, mm-hmm. so that we will see him face to face, and we'll never see death again. Yeah. Now, as the poem continues, again, these pairs continue. As it comes to a conclusion in verse 8, it does seem that Solomon starts to to maybe come back around to where we started. Yeah. It starts with a time to be born, a time to die. Here at the end, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. Those big things of life and death come here at, at the end. Right. Right. He he almost, uh, and, and I think... Uh... I think uh, I heard this a couple of times listening uh, on when you were going through the book of Psalms with the various pastors as well, um, the term uh, chiasm, uh, which is uh, just a fancy way of talking about the uh, Greek letter chi, which kind of looks like an X. And that's to say that, you know, sometimes you'll have something on one side of uh, a, a piece of literature, like a, a poem or a psalm, and on the other side, you'll have something that sort of brings you back again. It brings you back to that, uh, back to that. Um, here's where we started. Now we're going back there on the end so that you can see that and you can say, oh, okay, all right. Uh, now, based on all the stuff that's taken place in the middle or even this paragraph that we've got today that's going to follow, I can see how this all relates. So yeah, he, he goes right back to the big stuff in life, loving and hating, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know how you feel about this, Pastor Apple. Um, I get nervous about softening the word hate you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, Jesus, when he, when he talks in, in Luke's gospel about uh, if you're not willing to hate your mother or father, you know, uh, or, or even to hate your own life, Jesus talks this way, yeah. um, you know, for the sake of, of, of my kingdom, um, you're not worthy to enter it. And I, a lot of people get, I mean, those are hard words to hear. You can soften the word just a little bit and say when he says hate, what he means is that you should prefer the other, okay? Um, if you can have one and not the other— you're going to be with Jesus. You're going to take up your cross, follow him um, to the um, to the rejection of you know your family. If let's say they're not a, a Christian, kind of that kind of a situation. Okay, but I mean this this section we can I think we can dig a little bit deeper here, and we can ask ourselves this question: What does God hate? Right. Hmm. It's um, what does the Bible say about that? Oh, Pastor you Beck? know, I, I've pulled up a couple of things. Um, you know, God hates the worship of false gods. He talks about that in Deuteronomy twelve thirty one. Um, that's that's important because when we worship false gods, we're worshiping not only a lie, but we're worshiping something that is um, is imaginary, something that is non existent. We're worshiping something that is not real, and so when we do that, um, we're worshiping something that cannot give life, which is what God is in the business of doing. Okay, yeah. so God hates that. He hates when we uh, when we go that direction. When when folks do that, um, God hates evildoers. This is in uh, Psalm five, verse six. Okay, um, but lest we think that God is just like, um, okay, well, God hates me because I did something wrong. Like half the Bible is about the fact that He delights when the wicked turn from their evil and live. He calls them to repentance. He says, you know, stop doing that thing and let me save you. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, God hates those things. And I think that it's appropriate for us to hate those things as well. I mean, I hate the sin in my life. I think Paul talks the same way in Romans seven, doesn't he? And he calls yep. himself a wretched guy and all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, we're supposed to have that kind of, of hatred uh, that says, no, the stuff that is death in me, I hate that part of me. I want to stop being that. Okay. Now, what do you think, Pastor yeah. Apple? Are we on the right track? No, I, I, I think so. And I think the reason in this context is because of the parallelism with a time to love, a time to hate. Yeah. These two things are, are putting being put together as opposites, as opposed to other places where the sense may have less to do with that emotional aspect okay. of it yeah, and like more that. to do with the, the preference. Yeah. So I think the context here yields what you're talking about in terms of that that time to hate. The other the other place that, that came to mind was the way uh, Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 13 about love, yeah. and love you know doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. So there is that that aspect here, I think, as well, with the time to love, time to hate, time for war, time for peace. Yeah. All these things pass under God's appointed time. He is the one who directs all things, guides all things. The The words of, of Paul Gerhardt's hymn, Why Should Cross and Trial Grieve Me, mm. stanza three in Lutheran Service Book, those words come to mind. <laughs> God gives me my days of gladness, and I will trust him still when he sends me sadness. sadness absolutely. And I, I think a lot of—I mean, that's that's one way that I, I kind of hold these verses from Ecclesiastes 3 together, is that all of these times are God's appointed times, and I can receive them as his gift, even when it is a, a time of sadness that maybe I wouldn't have chosen. Yeah. God is still the one who's, who's directing all things. Oh, we can trust that he is, uh, that while we're experiencing the time as it's just, you know, seconds, minutes, hours, days, etc., he's actually um, appointing times, that he's actually behind those things and, and working in his time uh, for the sake of, uh, for the good of those who love him. Yeah, and are called according to his purposes. Sounds scriptural. That's right. Yeah. So Solomon has given us this poem all the way through verse 8, yeah. and then he begins to help us to understand and unpack that. He comes back to a topic that he's addressed already, but he's going to, to bring up again, and, and we'll see this elsewhere in the book of Ecclesiastes, the matter of the toil of, of man. Mm -hmm. So what, is, what does Solomon do as he starts to unpack <laughs> this poem for us? Yeah, so he's, uh, he, he sort of he points out, um, oh, this is, you know, we're both at work today on a, on a Thursday. We're recording today's show. Um, Solomon is here noting the futility of work. Yeah, I know. I know. Vanity. Vanity, vapor, vapor hevel. Yeah. Um, when Adam and Eve left Eden, it was with the charge to work the ground and keep it until you return to it. Hmm. Right? So you're going to take care of this dirt stuff, um, and it's going to bring about, you know, a grain that you have to mush down and separate, and then you have to, you know... Um, turn into flour, and you have to knead and add water and all the ingredients, and then you have to bake it, and then you eat it. Uh, but you know what? You're going to do that for, what was it, 80 years? 70 years? Or by 70 strength? to 80. Yeah, 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 yeah. All that kind of stuff. Um, and then what's going to happen? You're going to return right back down to that dirt. Um, you will decompose, and then somebody else will work that dirt, uh, and they will do the same thing that you have done. Wow, that's pretty bleak, isn't it? Talk about Hevel. <laughs> uh, talk about uh, vanity. Okay, something that is fleeting. But the point that Solomon winds up at is this. He goes, he kind of says, embrace the, the, the vanity of that. Embrace that, that, that uh, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm at a loss here for the word. Uh, embrace the fact that you, that things don't last. Kind of lean into it, I think, is the way the kids used to talk about that. You know, is just say, um, things are temporary, um, and I can be okay with the fact that things are temporary because, again, what is this all under the subheading of? For everything, there is a season given by God, mm. by the one who stands. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about for a time for every matter under heaven, the one who is over the heavens, the one who is in heaven, God himself. Um, he's directing things according to his time. And so, yeah, there are temporary things here. But again, back to the theme for the day, God is directing time according to his seasons according to his time, uh, which is perfect. So there's joy for us in working, eating, drinking, dancing, um, because these are from God. Yeah, I just think that's yeah. amazing. A absolutely. And the I think, you know, you lean into the meaninglessness yeah. of, of you on your own so that you would then lean upon God. And he gives and purpose to everything that we do. Right. Yeah. Right. Because apart from him, and, and this is where Solomon will I mean, repeat it over and over again. Apart from him, there is no meaning. Yeah. But with him, there's absolutely the meaning. And, and that's the point that he's really going to drive home in this section, that all of these times, even the times of toil, 
they are from the Lord. Don't don't trust in yourself or your own ability to kind of sort of escape this somehow. Look to the Lord as the one who gives these things to you, and then you have actually the rest, the in even in the work that God's given you to do. Uh, Pastor Apple, if it's okay, um, before we uh, tackle verse 11 here, which I think is just the—this is the, the coolest verse in this whole section, uh, can I look at verse 12 with you? Would that be okay? Oh, we're going to go out of order. We're going to go out of order, dear listener. I apologize. But li- listen to this. I, I'll allow I per- it. Thank you. Thank you. I perceive that there is nothing better for them, for mankind, than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all of his toil— and then he says, this is God's gift to man. What? Oh, that's cool. Okay? It is God's gift that he has given us these times to be born and to die, to break down, to build up, to embrace, to re- refrain from embracing. All of these things that God has given to us, um, we now receive them as gifts. Okay? Um, I was just talking with, uh, with a, a couple that we've got who are homebound here at Holy Cross. Um, they've been married for almost 72 years. Can you believe that? Wow. Yeah. God be praised. Yeah, praise God for that. You know, and, and he's he's kind of given his, his bride a hard time. And you know, he says, I think the good Lord just keeps her around so she can take care of me. He's in a wheelchair and, and she does all the driving. I mean, drives him a couple of hours to some of their doctor's appointments and things like that. You know, we live out in the country here. But, you know, to hear him talk about that and to hear him talk about, you know, I, I still remember the day that, that God gave her to me. It's like, wow, the Christian's perspective is that all things come to us from God as a gift. So much so that when we read through, I, I don't know, for instance, the book of Acts, and here are the, the apostles, and they're being beaten, and they're being thrown into jail, and then when they get, you know, they get sprung out of jail, they're walking around going, hey, you know, they're rejoicing that they should be counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. I don't know if I can quite wrap my head around that one, mm. uh, at least put myself in their shoes. But how great is it that Christians get to receive everything from the God, from God, um, the good, the bad, and even yes, the ugly, um, as gifts that He loves to give? I just yeah, think that's cool. A, that's awesome. That's <laughs> fantastic. And, and certainly, seventy-two years of, of marriage. Oh yeah. The Lord teaches that perspective over that time. No yeah. doubt. God be praised yeah. for His gifts. For yeah, his absolutely. Gifts. Now. Pastor Beck, you said verse 11, that's the really intriguing verse. And Ooh, I, I yeah. would agree, this is this is quite the verse here in the middle of Ecclesiastes 3. I'll just reread it. Sure. He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. What does this mean? <laughs> what does this mean? Well, that's the big question for the day, isn't it? Um, yeah. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Uh, God has appointed all of these times. Okay, um, and they are beautiful because God is the one who has appointed them. Okay, when God lines things up, such as the days of creation and the things that He's speaking, calling into existence, what does He keep saying? Uh, he steps back from His master canvas and He says, "It is good. It is good. It is good." But here we have the word "beautiful." He has made everything beautiful in its time, so everything is is taking place just like a a well run um, symphony right, uh, where the director is up there, the conductor, and he's waving his hands, and at just the right time, that, that person over there, time, again, we're talking about time, at just the right time, uh, that percussionist uh, dings the, 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 what is the little triangular the triangle, that one, yeah, and at yes. just the right time, you know, the piccolo comes in, and at just the right time, the bass drum is struck, and the timpani, and all of that kind of stuff, everything happens in the appropriate time, because God is the one who is ordering all things, um, and that's beautiful. So, I mean, that first of all, but then there is this, this contrasting statement. Also, at the same time, he put eternity into man's heart. Mm. Why, Pastor Apple, uh, has, has more money been spent um, than on anything else in all of creation on staving off death, right? You look at pharmaceutical companies, you look at what they, you know, we pay doctors, you look at, you know, the exercise and the fitness community, people eating all of this uh, supplemental things and, you know, this diet and that, and we put so much effort and energy into keeping death away. Why do we do that? Well, because we've got eternity into our hearts. We have this understanding that death bad, life good, okay? Mm-hmm. We were, we were built, we were created by God to live forever. And I think that's what this is reflecting here, um, is that we are eternal beings. 
And that's why death comes to us as a bad thing, because it's an invader uh, in creation, and it seeks to separate our bodies from our souls. Uh, thanks be to God that Jesus has died for both. Uh, that He has risen to uh, give new life to our souls even after we die, um, and then one day soon, I pray, to reunite body and soul together forever. Is that, that kind of your Amen. read on that situa- that section as well? Yes, but keep going, yeah. because so God's put eternity into man's heart, yes, but also so that we can't find out what God has done from beginning to end. Right. Why Why has God put eternity in our hearts in that way? Well, this is a callback to our introduction, right? And it's, it's a matter of perspective. Hmm. We're talking about high school students having lived 100% of their 16 years. You and I have lived 100% of our, you know, 30... 7, 38, 37 years, I think, is, is where you're still at, you know? Um, I'm at 38 now. Are you at 38? I'm with you. That must mean yeah, I'm 38. I caught up to you. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. A couple months yeah. back. I can't keep track. I'm sorry I didn't wish you a happy okay. birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so we've lived 100% of our we've 38 We've lived 100% years. of that. We've got all of that perspective. But God is eternal. That means he is over time. God is uh, is all times at once. God is... He is on the outside of time looking in, and so for for God, eternity is is a fathomable time frame, and for us, eternity is almost sort of a, I don't want to say a theoretical thing, but eternity is something that, that sounds wonderful to us, but, you know, describe eternity for me. Right. Well, I don't exactly have words for that. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't end. Yeah. Which is, I mean, everything ends. So how In can our experience everything? How can eternity ends. not. Yeah. I don't, so I don't so know. we we I mean we realize these things. God puts us into our heart. We don't fathom them. Yeah. What is God doing in that? Well, he he's reminding us that he's God and we're not. He's reminding us yeah. again back to the subject heading for the day that God is directing all of these seasons, all of these appointed times in our lives, um, and that we are simply enjoying those those times that he gives to us. We experience them as people under heaven, as people under the sun, S-U-N, right? The sun is up in the sky above us, scorching at 120 uh, degrees Fahrenheit around here in Texas. Um, God, he's above all of that. He's outside of all of that, but he lovingly cares for it. And of course, for Christians, the good news is that God has invaded history. God has broken into creation in the incarnation of his son. He sent Jesus to come down here and to experience time in the way that we experience time. I mean, Jesus is, you know, he's in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And we read that in the Gospels, and it's like, what, six verses, eight verses? Jesus is there for 40 days. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's there are very few things that I would like to do for 40 days um, all at once. I mean, that's why for some of us who, you know, fast uh, or, you know, give something up for Lent or take something on, you know, it kind of seems it drags on. Because we experience time like this. Well, that's what Jesus experienced there. Not eight verses of it, but he's being tempted. He's being tested 40 long days. So God has broken into creation in Jesus. He's invaded creation uh, to wage war against uh, well, against the devil, against the world, um, and against our own sinful flesh. Um, and he has come out the victor. Right, so that's that's the Christian move that we got to make here. That we got to we got to remember that that all of this talk of time and stuff, God is outside of that. He's above that, but He's also in it. And when He is in it, it is for our good. Hmm. And so the only way that this tension for us is resolved is when we truly fear, love, and trust in God above all things. You could say that. Yeah. <laughs> you you've got this quote in your notes from I think it's from Saint. St. Augustine oh, yeah, or St. Yeah, Augustine, yeah. depending on how you want to say his name. It's like the grass of the what, town of Florida, right? I, either, I don't know which way you say it. I'm sure our listeners... <laughs> Somebody can us. chime in, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Um, it, it's basically like this. Um, uh, Augustine said, um, he said, Our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee, O God. Okay? Um, and so... If you read Ecclesiastes, and this is maybe, this is, you know, not to take the whole, you know, you know to, not to put a bow on it, but this is the way that this whole thing ends. The whole book of Ecclesiastes is to say, for the unbeliever, Ecclesiastes has got to be one of the most depressing books that there is. I mean, if you don't believe in Jesus, read through the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, but make sure that there's somebody there to uh, keep you from doing harm to another or to yourself, because it makes everything look, well, like it's meaningless. 
Okay, yeah. But for the Christian, we see that there is perfect meaning in being known by God, being called a friend of God, being called a child of God. And so for us, we find rest in God. Um, and there is good comfort to knowing that, you know, maybe I'm in this time of weeping, um, but there will be a time of laughter. I'm in this time of mourning, but, you know, um, if, if it, even if it doesn't come until the resurrection on the last day, there's going to be a time of dancing. You can believe it. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Our hearts are restless until yeah. they find their rest in the oh God. Mm. We've got about four minutes here, Pastor Beck. And I think the last two verses of the text reiterate some of these things that we've been talking about yeah. and will provide a good way to, to wrap it up. The last two verses, again, say this. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Help us into these last verses of the text. Help us to wrap things up this morning. Yeah, these last two verses, they say that what God does lasts. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever, from Isaiah 40, verse 8. No one can add to God's plan or take away from it. No one can hinder God's plan. Right? Can you imagine that if God planned to do something and then somebody gets in the way of it and is like, no, uh, uh, you can't do that, God. That's not how any of this works. Doesn't work. Yeah. So this shouldn't drive us to despair. Instead, it should give us the ultimate comfort in knowing that the same God who loves us, he has planned all things for our good. In a way, uh, I think Ecclesiastes may drive the unbeliever into that place of just deep, dark despair, never getting out of it. But instead, for a Christian who reads Ecclesiastes, our faith actually grows deeper when we understand what God has done, what God brings uh, brings to us, and we receive these as gifts. We don't always want these gifts. Sometimes they're they're hard gifts, hard to swallow pills, and and difficult to to experience seasons in life. But that's that's what God gives us. So. For us, uh, if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of wrap all this up. You said we got a couple of minutes left, about two. Yeah, like two minutes. Yeah, we're going to do it in two minutes or less. Okay, so if we are viewing our life under the sun, right, just like all of us live, you know, unless you're, I don't know, on the other side of the solar system from us, okay, from our perspective, life may seem meaningless, void, vapor, vapid, hevel. But here's the deal. God invites us, especially through his son, Jesus, uh, who is the one who reveals God's great love, his kindness to us. We view our lives in the from above the sun place. Okay, Or if you like, you can just change out the S-U-N to S-O-N. Now we are under the sun of God. Now we, we view things from there. And so now we see that God holds eternity in his hand, that he promises us the rich blessing of life beyond this time when we reach the appointed time that he has laid out for us in the eternal life that is ours in Christ. I mean, isn't that, isn't that just a great way to think about time, that God has the time in his hands and he's, he's watching out for us. He loves us. We don't have to worry about the time. We just get to experience it as a gift. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Pastor Dustin Beck is pastor at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. He's been helping us today to study Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Pastor Beck, thanks for being our guest today. My pleasure, Pastor Apple. Good to see you. In Lutheran service book, Pastor Stephen Starkey has a hymn. It's number 762, There is a Time for Everything. And the fourth stanza goes like this. Before all time had yet begun, you, Father, planned to give your Son... Lord Jesus Christ, with timeless grace, you have redeemed our time-bound race. O Holy Spirit, paraclete, your timely work in us complete. Blessed Trinity, your praise we sing. There is a time for everything. Thanks be to the triune God who has won our salvation, who takes us to dwell with him in eternity. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Ecclesiastes chapter 3, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.